Are you a fan of the stars? Do you enjoy to go out at night and look up in the sky and see the constellations that are there? You ever look at the, the universe and think, man, how, how big and vast it is out there. And uh, we, we know from uh, recent technological developments that our universe is bigger than anybody ever imagined, uh, even just a, a few years ago. And uh, really, uh, we are, don't you feel like David did? As you look at this world, you look at the stars in the sky, you look at the mountains, you look at the rivers, you look at everything around, and aren't we left feeling a little bit insignificant? David, when he said, what is man? <laughs> when I considered all the work of your, your hands that you have uh, scattered the stars in their place, when I think about the moon and I think about everything that's out there and I, then I look to mankind, I'm just left to wonder what is man that you are mindful of him. And I want us to take a few minutes this morning and, and just kind of think about this idea of what, what is man. Uh, I do want us to uh, read Colossians 2, uh, chapter, four, or chapter 2, verses 4 through 8 uh, as we get started. Uh, we've spent uh, some time on these, uh, these few verses, and uh, uh, there, there's just so much here that uh, is significant and important for us. Paul, as he was writing in Colossians, he says this, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ." Uh, last uh, week, we, we spent some time talking about uh, a warning that Paul was giving, uh, given to the church uh, there in Colossae. Uh, he was warning them about being careful about the wisdom of men, the philosophies of men. And we talked about this, this warning that uh, it's not necessarily the, uh, the, the criticism of the discipline of philosophy as much as it is the, the need to examine every idea and see if it stacks up to the Scripture, if it holds uh, up to the scrutiny of the Scripture. Uh, and we illustrated that truth by looking at science and how uh, in our world today there is uh, a, a way that, that people are looking at science and they are using it in a way to, to uh, downplay the importance of faith as if you cannot believe in science and God. Uh, and I tried to make a distinction. I hope you were able to, to follow uh, that there is a difference between the process of science, the scientific method of studying and researching, observing, forming hypotheses and theories uh, and laws, uh, and the philosophy of science, that, uh, that this is absolutely the only way that we can know truth. And, and it's, uh, it's not that Christians have a problem with the process of science as much as it is with the philosophies of science that contradict the Scripture. Uh, and I wanted to highlight just a, a, a difference in how we would understand a process of theology uh, or uh, of science, a process of science and, and a, 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 a philosophy uh, based on science. Uh, and I would, uh, I would uh, use two words. Uh, the first word is astronomy. Uh, do, you, do you know what astronomy is? It's uh, when you go out and you look up in the sky and you see the stars that are out there. And, and there have been people who have undertook this, uh, this discipline, this science of studying the stars. Uh, and this is called astronomy. Now, there's another word, very closely related, and if we're not careful, we may confuse them, but they mean completely different things. And the other word is astrology. Uh, I hope uh, none of you here are really devoted to astrology, 
uh, because there, there is really some, some questionable things. Uh, so we would say astronomy is, it, it is the study of the universe. And, and we use, use things like math, uh, physics, and chemistry as a way of knowing the universe, uh, of knowing these, these things that are around us. Whereas astrology, if we understand, if I, if I understand correctly, astrology is a search for meaning based on the stars that are there. I don't know if you've ever been into reading horoscopes or fortune cookies or things like this, but uh, what, what astrology is trying to do is to tell us that, that the way the stars are arraigned in the skies and the way that they're moving have some influence on our life, and you need to live your life based on the movement of the stars, and, it, and it's a search for meaning. It's an interpretation of what is there. And, and we do have a situation where, you know, people do consult their horoscopes for advice. They, they you know, do, what clothes do I need to wear? And do I need to interact with this person based on their, their, their zodiac sign? Or do I look for someone of a zodiac sign because we we're, 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 uh, match up according to the stars? Uh, and so here we have the difference between a... Uh, um, uh, understanding through science or an interpretation that leads to the way we live our lives. And uh, I use this as an example to say, you know, I, I feel like most of us are able to recognize, well, uh, this is, is true and this is legitimate when we talk about astronomy, that we, we see the sun there and we you know, mathematicians have calculated the, the distance to the sun, and we see the moon, and we see the stars, and we've observed their patterns of travel through the sky, and we understand how it impacts our days, and our months, and our years, and uh, we, we understand that there's some legitimate things about that. And at the same time, we recognize that astrology is not legitimate. That, they're, that just because the stars are there and they're moving in this way doesn't mean that I should not wear red today because of the stars and how they have done. Uh, and it, it seems simple to us to make that distinction or to have discernment about what is right and what is wrong. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is not quite as simple, it's not quite as easy as making a distinction between astronomy and astrology. Uh, so we, we uh, uh, were talking last week about we observe, we look at this universe that we live in, we can see it, we can touch it, we can feel it, uh, and there, there are processes that we go through to understand it. But then at some point, we begin to leave a process and begin to enter into the world of philosophy. Uh, and I suggest this morning that sometimes it's a little difficult for us to understand when we move uh, from understanding a process to understanding philosophy. Uh, and so he, I, I wanted to spend just a moment maybe trying to further explain that. Uh, so we ask the questions, what? What is there? And, and the, the answer to that question, most of the time, can be something verifiable. We can come up with scientific data to, to uh, help our understanding of the question of what. Or even the question of who. We're going to ask the question, who is man or what is man that you are mindful of him? And uh, there are some answers we come to that. But, but the, the moment. At the very moment that we move from the who and the what question to the why question, we have moved from science to philosophy. Okay, and I want you to understand this. I want you to pick this up, that any time we move from the who and the what to the why, we, we are moving from process of science to philosophical understanding. You know what? This, this universe cannot tell us why. And this is one of the major differences that we as Christians have between uh, a, a faith uh, in God, that we find meaning and purpose and fulfillment in that, 
uh, and people who would be purely naturalistic or only would say that all exists, all that exists is this material universe, uh, they cannot tell us meaning. They cannot tell us why the universe is here or why we exist as people. And this is, this is an area that science does not cover. Uh, so we, we use science to, to understand the universe, math, physics, chemistry, uh, and we call these hard sciences. Uh, and uh, they give us some answers. They give us some verifiable data about what is going on. But then when we move from the question of who and what to the question of why, uh, we begin to get some, some more philosophical answers. And if I, we ask the question, who or what is man, uh, there are some hard sciences that would help us understand that. Uh, we know uh, that there is a science of biology, which is the study of life, and it would tell us that, that we live, that we, we breathe, and that we see, and we feel, and we, we do all of these things. And, and then along with that, biology, there would be uh, anatomy, physiology, other, other science disciplines that help us to understand uh, who we are. Uh, as people, and, but then we, we begin to ask the question, why? Why are we here? And we cannot answer that question. And so there, there is uh, this question in Psalm 8 that David asked, What is man that you are mindful of him? Uh, how, how is it that you have created the heavens and you have done this amazing work all around us? And it just boggles our, our, our minds when we think about this universe we live in. And then we think about ourselves and we ask, what is man? We, we have some, some biological, anatomical, physiological answers uh, about that. But then we turn to a more philosophical answer. Why? Why are we here? Why do we do what we do? Have you ever given any thought to, to what, it, what is it that motivates you to do the things you do? You say, well, it's hunger. I was hungry. I got up and I ate. I got a sandwich. And I, I, was, uh, I was sleepy, so I, I went to bed. Uh, and these are, these are physical things that, that uh, motivate us to do something. But you know, through the, through the history of the world, there have been people who have tried to ask this question in, in trying to figure out who is man, what is man, and, and why are we here, and why do we do what we do? And there, there are sciences that, that have tried to explain these. Uh, but whereas we would talk about sciences like math and chemistry and physics as hard sciences, uh, there would be another category that we would call soft sciences. Uh, and they, these would be things like anthropology, sociology, psychology. Uh, and these, uh, these are attempts that people have made to answer these questions around this idea who is man and why are we here? And as we consider these things, there are, uh, there are some philosophical things that, that we must be aware of, that we need a warning of, uh, that as people have tried to answer these questions and come up with the uh, reason behind these things, it, it's not that the the, the information that we get is, is verifiable. It's not that it's repeatable. Uh, like in math, chemistry, and physics, uh, there is a lot, there's a word of caution here because these things are a lot, a lot more subjective than the hard sciences. And so I want you to follow me just for a moment here that as we are uh, trying to understand who is man and why are we here, uh, that this, uh, this is something we've got to consider. Just like David, he looked at the stars and then he thought about the creation that God had made and then he looked at himself and he, he began to ask this question. And I think that, that that is before us today as well. We can look around at the universe, but we have to ask this question and we have to understand who is man? And what is man? Why are we here? And in, there's a couple different ways that the, the word anthropology is used. There is a sense in systematic theology that we study a major division of what the Bible talks about, about man. And this, uh, this, this is called anthropology. And I will refer to it as biblical or theological anthropology. And what it does is turn to the scriptures to try and answer these questions. Uh, who is man and why are we here? And as we turn to the scriptures and develop a biblical ar uh, archaeology, uh, anthropology, 
anthropology, uh, we would find that the Scriptures has some very important things to say. We are beings who are created in the image of God. That we are not in the same category as, as horses and dogs and pigs and butterflies. But there, there is something special, there is something unique about the way that God created us. We were made in His image. The Scripture would tell us that we're com composed of a soul and a body. All through the Scripture, it talks about us having an outer being and an inner being, a, a physical part of us and a spiritual part of us, uh, and that we are embodied souls, that, that yes, uh, biology and anatomy and physiology can answer a lot of questions about how we live and what our life is like, but we are also spiritual beings, and we have to understand the spiritual component of that, and where do we go to find that? And I believe that it's from the Scripture. The Bible tells us that as uh, human beings created in the image of God, a special creation of God, we are created for companionship. We are created to have a relationship with God. He made mankind to relate to Him. Uh, and not only a, a relationship with God, but a relationship with each other. And that He made us to exist in the community of people. That uh, as He created Adam and Eve, He created them to to exist in a relationship together. And then out of that relationship, his desire would, the, would be that children would be born and the earth would be populated. And this was God's plan and hope for mankind. We know that the doctrine uh, that we call sin or homardiology has changed about how, how we look at this. But uh, we, were, we were created for our companionship related to God and related to each other, and God has given us the work or the task of caring for creation. These would be some of the things that a biblical anthropology would understand, that we would, as spiritual beings, as physical beings, as embodied souls, these are components of the way that God has made us to be. Uh, there is another sense that we use the word anthropology. Uh, in our world today, there would be what would be called a cultural anthropo anthropology. Uh, and uh, that, that they study, uh, these uh, people study the habits of society and relationships. And uh, they look through history at societies and relationships. And, and they try and understand who we are and why we do what we do based on, on their studies in cultural anthropology. And there have been a lot of different uh, things that have happened over the years that, that have uh, contributed to this understanding of who is man and why do we do the things that we do. I mentioned a few ye a weeks ago a book uh, called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self uh, by a guy named Carl Truman. He, was a he is a professor, uh, author, wrote, uh, wrote this book to kind of help us answer some questions uh, that, that help explain the world that we're in today. Why, why is the world that we're in today the way it is? Uh, and he looks back at some philosophical ideas that, that have come about because of how people have tried to understand who man is and why he does what he does that is having an impact on our society today. And again, I, 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 will, I will warn you, I'm not discouraging you from reading this book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, but I do, I do want you to know it is a hard book to read. He has come back and written a, a, a more accessible version of it called Strange New World. How the, and the, the reason that he wrote these things is he says, you know, we live in a time, we live in a place where, where we are experiencing things in our society that just one or two generations ago, people would have thought was absolute insanity. The way we understand people, what is man? Who is man? Why are we here? Those questions have so drastically changed in the last uh, few hundred years because of the influence of people trying to answer this question, who is man and why do we do what we do? In the book, he talks about a lot of different people, and I'm just going to mention a few names, ones that you have heard of, unless you have been living under a rock for the entire uh, span of your life. He talks about people like Karl Marx, Friedrich Nietzsche, 
Sigmund Freud, and so many others who in, have influenced our world. And their ideas, whether you are, 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 are able to say what their philosophical beliefs were or what their thoughts were, uh, you are living in a world that has been influenced by them. And what they try to do, they try to answer this question, what is man and why do we do what we do? And their, their thoughts have impacted our world in such a way, uh, very profound ways that we live in a world where when we think about what is man and who is man, that we are bombarded with all kinds of ideas, ideologies, philosophies that are contrary to the truth of Scripture. And these are, we started last week with a faulty foundation, and this is part two of this idea of faulty foundations, that we are building our lives on ideas that are not going to hold up to the scrutiny of the Word of God. We're building our lives on man's ideas and man's philosophies that are not going to give us the fullest understanding of who we are. Again, these ideas have impacted our world in such a way uh, that even our grandparents or great-grandparents would have thought were insane. I do not have the time or the ability this morning to explain how all of these things have come to be. But the truth of the matter is this, our modern culture has been taken captive by these philosophies. When Paul wrote, he, he has this warning, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy. Again, any idea, any theory about God, any theory about the world, any theory about man, any theory about the meaning of life that contradicts the Scripture, Paul gave a warning, do not be carried away captive by these ideas, and the world that we live in has been taken captive by these philosophies. And a few of the ways that, that we experience in the world today, we cannot turn on the TV, we cannot pick up a newspaper, we cannot go to work or school without running into these ideologies, without running into these things. Uh, it, it are so prevalent, they are so prominent, uh, and uh, they're just everywhere we look. Uh, a few of the ones, uh, the, the, re the things that we see in our world that are coming from these questions that have been developing uh, over the last couple hundred years when people have tried to answer this question, who is man, why are we here, and why do we do what we do? Uh, some of these ideologies, philosophies is this, are these, uh, sexual practice and identity. How much do you hear in the world today uh, about these issues? And, and what is it like to, uh, to have a conversation in the world today? Uh, it, when we talk about sexual uh, things, is it, is, an, is it an activity, something that you do? Or is the world right that it's an identity, it's something that you are? There, there is a philosophical commitment to this that, that we need to be aware of. We live in a world that has very been taken captive. We are under assault right now over issues of gender identity. That the, you, you cannot, again, turn on the news. You can't go out in public without being assaulted uh, with, with things like the idea of toxic masculinity, femininity. What, what are those things? The words transgender, binary, non-binary, gender fluidity are, are words that, that you, you, our grandparents, our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents wouldn't have even known. And now it's everywhere we go, everywhere we go, we see just influenced with, it, with this idea. How many of you, how do you think your grandparents uh, would respond uh, to Matt Walsh asking the question, not is what is man, but what is a woman? I mean, we live in a world where this question has to be asked. Now, I'm, I'm not, uh, 
necessarily promoting Matt Walsh. I'm not necessarily uh, saying he's a good guy and we would agree on everything, but I, he asked a really important question that I think really gets to the heart of what is going on in our society. And uh, how many of you watch, have seen that and you, how, how volatile the reaction is when he uh, asks this question and begins to, to offer a different thing? Conversation is broken down because people are captivated by this idea. What would have seemed like a very simple answer to our grandparents and our great-grandparents, what is a woman, is now something that is extremely volatile. You want to blow up a dinner conversation? You bring up this issue. Even the closest of family is divided by areas and issues like this. Uh, what, another area that we, we see this in our world today is in the, in the issue of abortion. Do you know abortion is a question about personhood? Abortion is a question about rights. Uh, is the baby a person or is it a potential person? Okay, uh, which person's rights matter? These, uh, these issues about humanity, uh, are they, is it human? Uh, are they human? Will they be human? Uh, are they some kind of sub-person right now with the hopes of being a full person later on down the road? These are questions that our society is dealing with based on this idea of our understanding of anthropology, what it means to be a person, uh, uh, what is mankind. Uh, we, again, another issue we deal with in our world today is race and racism. How do we understand our differences? How do we go into a world where there are people of all different skin colors, red and yellow, black and white? I remember growing up, we sang the song, they are all precious in his sight, you know. Uh, but the, is race and racism, is it a real deal? Uh, is, is the idea behind racism that there are some races that are less human than other races? That there's some kind of subcategory of humanity? And I think that through history that we see that there has been this thought, there has been this belief that people of a different race or ethnicity uh, can't, are not fully human. And um, I think we would ask ourselves, does this idea only exist in Nazi Germany? Does it only exist in our history of slavery? Does it exist in the world that we live in today? And I say to you that it does. That these ideas of race and understanding who is man, what is man, why are we here? These are the hot button, hot topic issues of our day. And it's all related to this question. How do we understand who mankind is? How do we understand who we are as people? Do we see ourselves in relation to God? as the special creation of God? Do we see the Scripture having instruction for us about how to view and think about all of these things? And uh, we, you know, we've kind of talked about each of these individual ideas, but there's, there's something that, that's going on in our world where these ideas come to a head, they come to a forefront, and that is in the area of politics. And I, I am not a fan of politics. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about politics. I, I'm not here to tell you how to vote and who to vote for. Uh, my, my, my only purpose here is to tell you about the one person that really matters, and that's Jesus. You know, that we need to follow him and we need to seek the wisdom of the scripture and that there is no politician who is going to be the savior of this world because that position is already taken by Jesus. You know, and honestly, my opinion about poli uh, how do we understand politics is really to break, uh, break it down into root words. You know, sometimes things are, are you know, compound words, you know, and we, we get a better understanding of the, the compound word by looking at each of the parts that make up the word. And so how do you break down politics? Poly meaning many and ticks meaning blood-sucking creatures. Uh, <laughs> That, that really is what, what politics is. And all of these things come together. All of these ideologies, all of these questions, all of this anthropology is coming to the forefront in our political arena. Again, this is over and above my head in, in so many ways, and I, I just I don't even know. But the, the narrative out there, the... the the pressure that is on because of politics. And we're, we're getting ready to ramp up for an election season, right? They're, they're starting now to have primaries for the next presidential election. 
and there's going to be all kinds of mudslinging. There's going to be all kinds of, of things promoted in the name of, uh, of right and wrong and in, around these issues. Uh, in politics, every, every side, every candidate, every party uh, is about gaining power. Gaining power so that their agenda can be the law of the land. And these ideologies come together at the forefront of this. And, and, and we, we really are in a world where all of these things are happening. And, and where are we as Christians? How do we begin to even talk about this? How do we begin to have a, a, a peaceful conversation with the people that are around us when one word from us ends up just blowing up the conversation? We, we live in a world where people are captive to this idea. And I want to just ask you this, why do we need to talk about this? And if you're, if you're paying attention, yes, that was a theological, philosophical question. Why do we need to talk about things like this? Why do we need to be aware of these ideologies that are in the world? And I would say there, there are some reasons. There, there are some reasons that we need to talk about this. And one of the things I would put on the top of my list is this, is that I believe the Apostle Paul would write a letter to churches today about the ways that ideas from the world have crept into the church. And he would name it specifically and say, you are trusting in things that are not according to the Word of God. And we need to look at the Scripture, we need to understand what the Scripture has to say, and we need to do our best in a systematic way to understand what God would say about all of these issues. And I believe the Scripture does tell us these things. And so uh, here in Colossians, when Paul is issuing this warning, do not be deluded and led astray by these wrong ideologies. And when he's saying, don't be held captive by philosophies, that we need to be on guard. We need to keep our eyes open. We need to have discernment in order to be able to know the difference between what is true and what is wrong. And we need to have the boldness to speak up. And uh, like I, I mentioned in 2 Corinthians, uh, we need to be able to say things that destroy philosophies and arguments that are set up against the knowledge of Christ. I believe that, that there are many of these ideas that have crept into the church uh, that I believe we need to talk about this because these competing ideas have a real impact on how we live our lives. Uh, when uh, uh, every one of us come to church and we uh, are living our lives and, and there, are, there are, I'm sure even among us, that there are those of us who, in the language of Colossians, are living our lives according to human ideas and there is real harm in following the human ideas that are against the things of God. Uh, we, we, we must talk about these things. And I would say, along with Paul uh, sounding his alarm to the Colossians, giving them a warning about these wrong ideologies, that we need to sound an alarm. We need to issue a warning today about faulty foundations that so many people are building their lives on. And what it really comes down to is this, is that there is only one true, sure, and steady foundation that you should be building your life on. And the message of the Bible is this, is that Christ is the only firm foundation. He is the only solid rock. All other ground is sinking sand. The ideologies and interpretations of men are always changing. They're based on limited information and they are under the influence of what the Bible tells us is a nature that is cursed by sin. You know, as we think about this, it, there is a sense, a part of me, that uh, it feels a little hopeless. As, I, as I'm in the world, what, what good, what, what, what can really happen? Is it going to do any good to say anything, or am I just going to make somebody mad by, by, by trying to, to say there's a better way to understand who we are? Uh, and, and, and we're, we're torn between that, that. but I, have, I do have a real hope, and this is my hope for us, for our church, uh, that as we uh, get into the Scripture, as we grow, uh, like the, we talked about a few weeks ago, we grow up in the truth, we, we are, send our roots deep down into the soil, and we are standing strong and stable, like Paul was talking about, I do have hope, I have hope that we will stand strong in our faith. In uh, verse 5 of chapter 2, 
Uh, when Paul was writing the Colossians, he says, I rejoice to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ, even though he was writing to give a warning to them about these wrong ideologies that were trying to make their way into the church. He says, I see that you're standing strong, and I want you to encourage you in that, that this is what you should be doing. And I hope that we would also stand strong in our faith in Jesus Christ. I hope that we we will not only stand strong, but they, we will walk wisely. Uh, verse 6, it says, uh, uh, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and abounding in thanksgiving. In chapter 3, he goes on to say that we, we need to walk in wisdom with the world around us uh, and that we need to, to take into consideration the things that are going on and we need to be able to relate in a way that that, that is, is wise and winsome and that as we share this message about Jesus that we walk wisely in this world. And then the last thing is this, is that we would build boldly on the faith in Jesus Christ. He is the firm foundation. And next week we're going to start with looking at Jesus as the firm foundation as we begin to pr- move further through chapter 2 and talk about uh, that, uh, that uh, he is really the one that we, we need to spend our time on. I know for these last few weeks, we have taken some time to talk about some of, the, some of the difficulties, some of the philosophies, some of the ways that we need to be on guard, some ways that we need to be warned about, about the ways of man. But I want to suggest to you that these, uh, these have been a glance. You know, what's a glance? It's a quick look at something. Yeah, some of you may be saying, well, that's debatable. You quick, I don't know. Uh, but, but really, a gaze is, is, is a quick, a quick, a glance is a quick look. And we, we've taken some time to have a, a, a glance at these things, at some of these philosophical obstacles that we face in the world. But as Christians, that, that our, our, our views, our eyes, what we set our minds on, what we set our eyes on is not the problems of the world. We don't, that, that doesn't need to be where we dwell. That doesn't need to where we have continual watching and waiting and, and our eyes are fixed on the things of the world. But what we're moving on to, what we're getting to is this, is that we fix our gaze on Christ that we don't look only at the philosophical obstacles and the problems that we face in this world, but that as Christians we look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, the hope that we have in this world. He is the one that we need to go to. And we will see in chapter 3 and chapter 4, he says in chapter 3 verse 1, if you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Paul's encouragement encouragement to the Colossians and Paul's encouragement to us today would be this, set your mind on things above. Uh, That is where the real hope is. That is where the real uh, foundation is. And so as we move forward, I want to encourage you in that, that we move forward having glanced at these problems, but fix your gaze on Christ. I want us to go to the Lord in a word of prayer as we finish this time this morning. We're going to have a, a song of invitation, and I would invite you. You know, uh, you know, I don't know of a time that we've ever need to pray for wisdom from God like we do now. And I feel like that is a very fitting prayer for us to pray as we're trying to understand the things that are going on in our world, that we would ask God to help us to be wise about understanding how these philosophies of man are so captivating the culture that's around us, and that we not be captivated by them as well. Maybe you're here and you, you uh, have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ and you, you want to know more about that. You want to hear about more about this firm foundation that you can build your life on. I'd be glad to have an opportunity to talk with you more about that. Uh, and so if you would like to do that, let me know either during this time or after uh, service this morning. We'd be glad to talk more about that. Well, let's go to the Lord in word of prayer. Our musicians are going to come.
God, our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this morning, and Lord, Lord, we are, we are desperate to know what you have to say, and Lord, we, we want to go to your word, and we want to find the wisdom that you have for us about this world that we live in. Lord, we are, we are surrounded on every, time, every side, it seems, uh, with issues, with problems and philosophies that are against you and against your word, and God, I pray that you would help us to be, be wise and discerning, but also, Lord, uh, loving as we interact and, and have conversations with people that are around us. God, I pray for our church, God, that we would stand strongly, that we would walk wisely, and that we would build boldly on your word. God, I ask 